activities at his birth day music department. And uh, I think we're going to use, uh, today we're going to use a little bit of time to talk about our creative process, uh, how this pro project that comes, uh, comes through. And then maybe, hopefully, time allows, we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end. Um, so, I guess we all know what Angel Island is and what its purpose, but just in case you're new to the Bay Area, uh, Angel Island was, um, has a detention center um, where they process immigrants back in uh, early 19. 1930s, I believe. Uh, so many Chinese and uh, Asian uh, immigrants, in order to avoid the wars, they will come to this country uh, hoping there is a chance of finding a new life. You know, uh, you know, but a lot of the high hopes turn into a, a despair. So there's uh, many tragic stories happen, uh, very opposite kind of seen that as we see on a, at this island on the East Coast. So uh, there are composers been writing uh, compositions based on Angel Island, but uh, no one, as I know, have done a choral oratorio um, that's this by Mamua, which will be it's the first time that uh, it's came to light. So, uh, I would like to briefly thank uh, Susan Moffat and uh, Lisa Weimar at Arts and Design for initiating this whole project. So, um, it is uh, really turned out to be a very meaningful uh, learning experience for both my students and myself. As a Chinese immigrant coming to this country, I have no idea what's happening. And until we visited the island, there visited the museum and I saw all the poems on the wall and all the you know stories that came out of that. It was just overwhelming. So uh, I think that this is a very powerful story needs to be told, especially in today's society and then things are you know really kind of in turmoil. I say in a way, uh, you know we. Right? We sing through the score, 
and they're just words, and there's music just artificially delivered to you, and you were forced to taking it in, and like taking a warm bath. And it won't mean anything. So uh, I just thought, we need to do more to let this emotional, very strong piece to come through. And uh, last year we did an Annalise, which is an Anne Frank's diary, and we staged it, and it was a such an impactful uh, um, work, where I learned that, that movement is a really strong message. Because audience, like as audience, and you are more, we're more visual people, right? So sometimes you don't have to really hear the words. And I, I think it's not even possible you can hear every single word, what the choral people singing. But movement translates, right? So I think that's where it came to I would like to get this piece staged. Even just when we're moving a little bit, you know, like minimal movements, walking on the stage. That could portray a many, like that could create much of the imagination in your head. Say, hey, what does that mean they're walking? Is it, are they thinking? Are they sad? The way how they walk. If they walk fast, my means they're frantic, right? What, so those are just, it's a very simple movement, but that can give you much, much more message and, and the imaginations. I think that is very, very important. That's why, you know, I said, well, Kai, why don't you come back? Because last year was a good, good experience. I loved it. I said, do you want to do this again, you know? So, um, and then, randomly, I, I saw Olivia Ting. And talking on a completely different topic, and then she's talking about her work of doing Angel Island uh, for a dance piece. And I said, well, you know, we're doing Angel Island. Why don't you come join us? So there, you know, I came at Olivia trying to transform the whole entire stage. I thought it was, you know, uh, maybe some of you might know when the Angel Island premiered last year, it was on the Angel Island. So if as any audience who listen to this piece, the Angel Island piece on the Angel Island, you might feel the emotional uh, pull, right? You can imagine and right there with the, the you know the, 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 the detention center, the people who are you know sitting there. But in here we're bringing to a concert stage. That's the challenge. How can we bring that kind of a, you know, a strong, um, you know, power on this stage, but to maintain that kind of a strong impact. So I thought, you know what, let's get Olivia involved. Let's transform this stage into a completely different space so that people will have a chance to imagine, you know, to feel. I think we don't just listen to music artificially. We listen with our heart. And that's why we do arts, because we want to touch the heart. And that's the power of arts that can make us better human. So um, without talking too much, as I can go on and on, <laughs> uh, I will just get it in order, having each artist right here, to talk about their creative process, you know, um, how this work comes through, and uh, what's going through your, what's going through your head while you're designing it. What's special about this whole process? So, Kwang Ro, would you like to talk about how you um, how this piece come around and uh, your thoughts of designing the whole general piece? Thank you. First of all, thank you for having this piece presented for uh, uh, tonight to all of you and for coming to see it. Uh, I often felt. Um, you know, with as a composer, uh, when I get older, I become pickier, pickier of uh, things I do. Uh, I like to say no to things now because I know with limited life I will have, and uh, I can't do everything. So everything I do, I want to have a meaning. I want to do something that could be impactful, has a meaning. Uh, so when the Del Soko contacted me about collaborating on. Uh, the poetry from the Angel Island. Um, they sent me a, the book, the poems from the islands. 
uh, I read them. They are written in Chinese. They carved into the wall of the detention center. And I announced them in Zim now. Uh, it was very powerful, uh, but not until I went to visit it in person. Uh, I really felt the emotion and the, it's indescribable. Uh, almost hearing voices in my head. Uh, if you went on YouTube, you might see a clip. Uh, I improvised singing with uh, two musicians on the quartet. At that point, we were just you know, inspired to do something musical. Uh, that part of the history was able to be kept and uh, served as the genesis of this project. Um, and last year, uh, we went back to premiere the work, um, and that was a very different time from now, and every singer has to be masked. Uh, all the artists are masked, and at first we were not even sure whether we could sing inside or not. We were planning to do it outside, and it was raining, and then we kept inside. So, I would say that experience really made me feel accomplished. Creating this work. Uh, yes, uh, music people often say it's a floating architecture. In this piece, it's, it's a floating uh, monument. It can be history alive, keep the history passing through from generations at home and from others, one to another person. So uh, it's a very meaningful uh, collaboration, and every collaboration is different. Today, we have this wonderful team here, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Maestro Chong Wei and Chong Wei to uh, lead the wonderful vocal group, and we present a, a new version. And uh, that's the beauty of the artwork, and each time you come, you take different things away from it. So uh, it is a heavy piece in the sense the subject is heavy, uh, but if any person walking out today remembering uh, any words, any notes, any visual, any movement, I think we, we, make, we make an impact. So, um, and I, I welcome all your thoughts and look forward to talking with you afterwards. Thank you. Also, the air, you see the seagulls, um, 
that's what I mean by Rusa. <laughs> but they are actually quite beautiful if you watch them. And so, um, so this kind of metaphors uh, become kind of symbols of hope um, or symbols of envy. Um, the fact that these birds can fly and they can go up a silent, whereas those who are injured could not. So there's a double meaning to all of these, um, these visual elements that I chose. So water brings you here, but water also locks you on this island. Dirt air can provide light, but dirt can also bury you. So um, in the end, uh, we bring back the birds again, and I invite you to interpret the birds as how you like. So, um, yeah. <laughs> specific place 
from very specific material yet to resonate that with the audience from different communities, from different parts of the world, to make that work to be timeless and space, uh, I won't say spaceless, but universal. So uh, when, uh, when I was writing it, um, one of my biggest challenges was uh, that was during the pandemic. And uh, as we might all recall, our country was very divided and still is divided. But at that time, uh, as Asian American, we were labeled as the virus, as the uh, China flu, all kind of wordings. And uh, I remember there was some July 4th, uh, I brought some firework for my children to, you know, to play. And I was so excited that I saw them having a great time. I wanted to tell, I, I, I asked them, I said, do you know who invented firework? And then they looked at me, want me to tell them. And then I swallowed my words. I could not tell them it was Chinese invented the firework. I know they are so proud to share that not just with anyone. But at that point, I have this fear in my mind. What if they told that to other people at school? What if they reveal they have the Chinese heritage? They will get punished. They will get discriminated. All these consequence, consequences came to my mind and that made me afraid to tell them my second part of what I'm trying to say. I thought about that overnight. The next day, of course, I, I told them. But it took me one night. And this is not right, and this is not normal. No one should feel lesser than anybody in this country. That's not the reason we all came here to celebrate, to, to try to have our American dream. So Angel Island, in a way, was born also out of this divisiveness. And in hope, to share that universal message of when we come together with respect, with sharing, with caring, we stand a little taller today than yesterday. So that was my biggest challenge and triumph. Thank you.
is like is very pedestrian. And so we felt that the singers were more than capable of embodying the movement. And maybe even in some ways better than a dancer might. Like a dancer might be very performative in places where actually we wanted the movement to go pedestrian. Um, but one challenge I think that came up is just that we, in a dance context, we tend to work um, in a way that is co pretty collaborative. And so we might come in and have ideas or images that we want to try, and we try it, and then we say, OK, pause, change this one thing, let's do it again. Now we want to do it in a different way, and we can just like try it again and again and again. And we really didn't have that type of time with this process. It was, uh, we had to make it all very fast. Um, and also, the singers are, they might be, some of them are out of their comfort zone and they're already holding so much information and remembering so many things just about the music. And so there's, there was a bit of like trying to gain trust and, and comfort within the process of like, yes, I know you're doing all that and also I'd like you to do this thing too if you can. <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that I think the biggest challenge was writing. <laughs> yes, it's very challenging, but you know I love it, and I think there's the payback is the reward at the end is so much greater than what we put it in, and, and I think the students. Get to understand music better too. Uh, in the last year, when we did a, an analyse, and actually we got tears on stage and off stage. You know, I mean the music is beautiful, but I think it's so much more because the movements and all these other elements that has played in, and that was making it powerful. So I'm a firm believer of all these, you know, multi dimensional uh, kind of arts involvement to make this uh, a very special piece. So I really hope you all can, uh, you know, it's a magic, sort of has a lot of meditative state of mind too. So be present and be patient and just, just be here with us for an hour and a half. You know, I hope you will like it as much, love it actually, as much as I do. And uh, I'm very looking forward to talk with all of you, some of you, after the concerts. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think we have much time for Q and A, which uh, I would love to have. Some, but if maybe we can take one question. If uh, you have questions, anyone?
so that enable us to uh, create this work. So that was the genesis of this.
this uh, performance this evening is a collaboration among so many people. Uh, and uh, I am the creative director of Future Histories Lab and executive director of the UC Berkeley Global Urban Humanities Initiative. And these are interdisciplinary programs uh, that hope to train students to look at the world through many disciplines, uh, especially including the arts. And uh, tonight's program is a collaboration between the Department of Music, and we're very thankful for the support of uh, Chair David Milnes. And it's also a collaboration with uh, the Arts and Design Initiative, which is led by Lisa. Uh, we're also very happy to have as our community partner, the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. Uh, and very, hello, Ed, Ed Barney, is that what you're doing? so many wonderful campus and community partners in this project. I'm not going to name them all, but I really encourage you to go to our website so that you can learn more about the project that this performance is just one part of. We've organized something called A Year on Angel Island, and this is a year of exhibitions, performances, public lectures, courses, and creative projects. And they are all using the Angel Island Immigration Station as an observatory from which to think about issues of immigration, othering, and belonging. And so we're using this very specific place uh, in uh, San Francisco Bay and its um, challenging history to think about the ways that people have overcome uh, othering and exclusion. Um, and the, I think that the arts uh, can help us think through some of the, the ways that we can understand our relations uh, to each other as human beings better, and also can connect to disciplines of history and sociology and architecture, uh, art history, all the, the different disciplines that we've been working with together uh, to think through these issues. Um, and I'm especially excited to bring you this oratorio tonight because it is this piece of music that actually inspired the entire year of programming. It was uh, a little over a year ago that I heard a performance of this oratorio inside the detention barracks uh, where immigrants from many countries, um, and many especially from China, were detained. And uh, hearing the music evoking uh, the suffering and the determination of those people uh, inspired me to think we need to bring this performance, this piece of music, to the UC Berkeley campus in a way that will let students uh, use it again as a jumping off point for starting inquiry into the history and understanding uh, more about this place and this history. Uh, we have a lot of great uh, events coming up in the spring. It's continuing into the spring. We have speaker series, we have a poetry series. If you want to learn more, you can sign up for our newsletter. Please go to futurehistories.berkeley.edu and you can see all of the wonderful programming we have coming up. Um, and I especially want to make sure that you know about a wonderful dance performance that is coming up. And Lisa's going to tell us about that. Yeah, I'm so excited. Um, Sal Tan Pan, who's the chair of my department, Theater Dance and Performance Studies, is here in the house as well. And she's going to be um, uh, helping direct this incredible performance of choreographer and Lenore Lee, who did uh, a piece also on Angel Island, within the barracks called Within These Walls. And Lenore will be staging that piece in uh, the Department of Theater and Dance Performance Studies, February 23rd and 26th. So we're so excited about that. And thank you, Sankan, for wanting to support this project and um, sort of create the anchor in uh, dance and theater, uh, paralleling and kind of creating a synergy with music. Um, Olivia Chang, who did the video for Chinese performance, will also be doing a video for that. Um, and it really is a place to showcase undergraduate connection and performance and work uh, using um, the arts and the stage to deepen their studies and um, experiential learning into this place-based um, research that we're providing on your enjoyment. Um, and Laura's piece really began as a commemoration of the 135th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so just acknowledging that, the pain of that policy, and um, it's meditation on healing, <coughs> resilience, and compassion. And so tonight we hope that that is also um, coming through in the of the performance. So thank you all. And
and enjoy.
authorities arrested and prosecuted 10 rioters. Eight were convicted of manslaughter at trial and sentenced to prison terms at San Quentin. Their convictions were overturned on appeal due to a legal technicality. The eight men convicted were Esteban Alvarado, Charles Austin, Fugio Potello, L. F. Crenshaw, A. R. Johnson, Jesus Martinez. Patrick M. McDonald, Louis Mendel, the following people were lynched. Dr. C. Long Jean Tang, physician. Chong Wang. Long Wai, laundryman. Ah Long, cigar maker. Wan Fu, cook.
Medical Association believed that Chinese immigrants carried distinct germs to which they were immune, but from which whites would be die if exposed. This fear became concentrated on Chinese women because some white Americans believed that germs and disease could most easily be transmitted to white men through labor with Chinese prostitutes. As a result, the Cage Law responded to what were believed to be serious threats to white men, white lives, and futures. Thank you. 
20 years, the great free continent of America and the free state of California has been troubled with an invasion which threatens to overrun it as the great plagues overran Egypt. The hordes of Asiatic coolies that have found their way to our land, threatening California and the whole United States with the establishment of a heathen Chinese Republic, should be controlled in the interest of our grand European and American Christian civilization. If this country is the asylum of foreigners, it is not or should not be the refuge of paupers, convicts, and slaves, such as are the bulk of the Chinese now here and immigrating hither. They should be made an exception to the rule which operates to the advantage of all desirable immigrants. The Chinese in California are the advanced guard of numberless legions that will, if no check is applied, one day overthrow the present Republic of the United States. Those now here are corrupting the morals and undermining the framework of our social structure. They are introducing a degraded system of cheap labor and encouraging and enticing our capitalists under a false pretext of developing our resources to discharge competent and honest white men. This system, if continued, will entail upon our people evils far worse than those which resulted from African slavery, which brought such terrible disaster and bloodshed upon the land. That stain upon freedom was wiped out at a dreadful cost in blood of brave citizens and in the expenditure of enormous treasures, the fruits of which are now eaten through a system of unjust taxation, which we are hardly able to bear, and in bitterness of feeling between the North and South. The African now enjoys the privileges of an American citizen, but it was only after a revolution of unparalleled magnitude that he reached such a condition. No enlightened patriot would wish to see the day or the perfection of a system that would involve the nation in another rebellion, sweeping across the continent like a tornado. Time, sweet time, has proved when nothing else could to be the solver of great problems, even when philosophers and statesmen have proved inadequate. Time moves onward. It is pure, sure, and confident, and it works its way through storms and conflicts. It may be with our great heathen Chinese Republic in California that it shall lie with time to demonstrate its dangerous attitude to the great Christian free state. Here in California, with a Chinese population approximating 125,000, nearly all of whom are actual bondmen, subject to secret laws and tribunals contrary to the Constitution of the United States, having larger privileges as a rule in our courts of law and justice than any other foreign element or than the free-born natives of the soil. What we find in the metropolitan city of San Francisco, the very heart of the business portion, contaminating our growing youth by the means of cheap prostitution, of which medical testimony can be given. Having no desire to become enlightened with the truths of civilization and Christianity, living only for the purpose of hoarding our dollars and cents, viewing all our institutions from a basely material standpoint, indisposed to become naturalized citizens, even if our federal laws permit it. Here, let me insert the opinion of Reverend W. Laoshi, for over 20 years a missionary in China, who has lately published a pamphlet entitled, Evidences of the Affinity of the Polynesian 
and American Indian with the Chinese and other nations of Asia, derived from the language, legends, and history of those races. Mr. Lockheed says, the China man is physically and intellectually inferior to the European. He is cruel and victorious and fond of taking precautionary measures which subject the conquered to unnecessary tortures. He does this more from want of confidence in his own bravery and courage than from an innate pleasure in cruelty. Being himself timid, he is fond of intimidating others, even animals, by subjecting them to agonizing tortures. He is docile when conquered, but more from shrewdness than from a delight in that which is just, equitable, and good. He is less brave than obstinate, and unable to redress the real or supposed wrong. He will have recourse to suicide. He will bear tyranny and oppression for a long time before offering resistance. He is more imitative than inventive, and in manual labor, he will often take recourse to simple mechanical arts. He is clever, but has little taste. He devotes more time to useless curiosities and fancy work than to grand works of art and science. Mathematics, chemistry, natural philosophy, and mechanics have never been subjects of scientific research. He is avaricious, fond of vagrancy, and of games of chance. His love of money makes him an habitual thief. His fondness for vagrancy, a highway robber. And his love of hazard games has made him untrustworthy and quarrelsome. In order to obtain riches, he is persevering, diligent, frugal, and contented. But in possession of it, he is apt to become a loathsome gourmand, a slave to sensualities more inclined to tyranny than to generosity, delighting more in frivolity than in morality. Not pleasure in the pursuit of science, but delight in power stimulates him in his study of the classical works. His mind is lacking in fervency and in feelings of gratitude toward friends and benefactors. The misfortune of others does not affect him to tears, but tempts him to laugh. Intercourse with others, he is reserved, shrewd, and untrustworthy. Hence the aversion of the European or the Mongolian race, and his greater inclination toward the Hindu and the Negro. The lack of regular holidays, which induce other nations to put on festive garments and to cleanse and adorn their dwellings, has made him a habitual workman, in whom the sense of cleanliness is a face.
our citizens' residences, there you will find John the Chinaman. Everywhere is the inevitable Mongolian. Before long, every 